There is this tiny, lush, heavily forested, beautiful island 93 miles off the coast of Brazil that no matter how beautiful it looks, no one will go to this island. In fact, you're not allowed to go to it because the Brazilian Navy has forbid it. So the legend of this island really began in the early 1900s when a local fisherman was off the coast of the island and saw right on the edge of the forest were these beautiful banana trees with all these bananas that were ripe and ready to be picked. And he thought, I can easily pull my boat over to those rocks over there, hop out, grab some bananas and bring them home, no problem. That'll take me, you know, 10 minutes to do. And so he pulls over by himself to get these bananas. He anchors his boat, he walks up the beach, he climbs up the tree and he starts hacking down some bananas. And while he's up there, he suddenly feels a sharp pain on his rib cage and he falls out of the tree and he looks down and he's bleeding out of his rib cage because he can see it on his shirt, there's blood on his shirt. Was there a branch that jabbed me in the side? Like, what was that? And he's alone, he's 93 miles from the mainland. And so in a panic, he ditches the bananas, he runs to his boat, gets it unanchored and starts making his way back to the mainland. But on the trek back, he passes out in the boat. Later that day, another group of fishermen see this boat kind of drifting around near some rocks and it looks like something's wrong. So they make their way over to it and there's this fisherman who went to get the bananas, but he's lying on his back. He's clearly dead and he's in a pool of his own blood. 20 years after this incident, there was a lighthouse keeper that was assigned to work on this island and he brought his family with him. They were staying in the main house of the lighthouse and it was going fine for the first couple of days they were there. But at some point, captains of vessels that would drive past this island and relied on that lighthouse noticed that the light wasn't on. And so they reported it to the mainland and a search party was sent out to check on the lighthouse keeper and his family to make sure that they had all their supplies and that they were okay. When they get to the lighthouse, they find the entire family is dead in their bed. And the only clue they had were these puncture marks all over the bodies of these deceased lighthouse keepers and an open window. So what killed these people that went to this island? Technically they died from a poison that literally melts your organs within 60 minutes of coming in contact with it. But that poison comes from a very famous venomous snake called the Golden Lancehead Viper that only exists on this island. They exist nowhere else in the world. And so this island has been dubbed Snake Island. And since nobody goes to this island, the Lancehead Viper population has exploded. They are thriving on this island. In fact, researchers say that there's at least 3,000 of these venomous snakes that live on this island. And for every one square meter of the island, there is a snake, which means if you're on this island, you are always within one meter of something that can kill you. And these snakes aren't just on the ground either because their primary food source are birds. And so the snakes have begun to live in the trees and catch birds that land in the trees. Meaning if you happen to be walking on this densely forested island, you'd be surrounded almost 360 degrees by these wickedly venomous snakes that if you are bit, you have 60 minutes to get the antidote. If you don't, you're doomed 100% of the time. Nowadays, the only people that go to this island are the Navy, who replace the batteries in the lighthouse, which is now automated because it's too dangerous to be there. They go once a year to replace those batteries. Researchers occasionally go there, and you have poachers that go to try to catch some of these snakes because they're so rare, they can sell on the black market for 10 to 30,000 US dollars. But many of these poachers that manage to sneak onto the island just get bit by these vipers and die. So there you go, karma. In early 1945, during World War II, the British decided they wanted to take back Ramri Island from the Japanese. Ramri Island is a fairly large, totally flat island off the coast of Burma that was a great staging location to fly air campaigns onto the mainland. So it was a great air base. And the British had actually owned this island, but the Japanese had taken it back from them in 1942. And so here they are in 1945 looking to take it back. So on January 21st, 1945, British and Indian infantry stormed the beaches of Ramri to try to take it back. As soon as they land, they have all this naval artillery support just 
bombing the crap out of this airbase, and it was just a matter of time before they overwhelmed the remaining Japanese. But the Japanese do not want to surrender, and instead they give up the airbase that they were on, so the British take that back, and the remaining thousand Japanese soldiers started retreating to the opposite end of the island, to where there was a much larger battalion of Japanese soldiers that they could meet up with. But the only issue with this particular retreat was they would have to go through 10 miles of mangrove swamp where there's poisonous spiders and insects and deep mud making it almost impossible to move, but they're determined and they head off into the swamp. But what the Japanese were not ready for is what Ramri Island is famous for, a creature that makes poisonous snakes and spiders and insects look like child's play. And they were walking directly into its den. The British troops decided we're not gonna go chasing them into the swamp. And instead what they did is they set up boats, blocking positions outside of the swamp. If any of the Japanese tried to escape, they would be there waiting. And so the only way the Japanese could get out of there would be to go to the absolute other end, 10 miles away where their Japanese counterparts were. So that night as the British are just kind of hanging out in their boats, staring at the swamp, they start hearing screams coming from inside of the swamp. And it's Japanese soldiers, then you hear gunfire and then silence. And then it would start all over again, all over this huge swamp it was just screams, gunfire, silence, screams, gunfire, silence. And the British are watching this like, do we have troops in there? What's going on in there? What was going on in there is defined by the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest massacre of humans caused by animals. And not just any animal, saltwater crocodiles. These massive man-eating crocodiles can weigh up to 1,000 kilograms or 2,200 pounds. They can grow to be seven meters in length or about 23 feet in length. And National Geographic has labeled these crocodiles as the most likely to eat a human of all animals. And Ram Ree Island has the largest population of saltwater crocodiles in the world. And they all lived inside of the swamp that the Japanese had gone into. A lot of them were bleeding from the battle they were in. And so they were literally alerting hundreds of saltwater crocodiles to their location. Saltwater crocodiles are notorious night hunters. So what probably happened is the Japanese got inside of this mangrove. The crocodiles were immediately aware of their presence, but they waited until nighttime before they started having a feeding frenzy. And over the course of the night, a number of Japanese soldiers had jumped out the sides of the swamp, exposing themselves to the British. And so about 20 of them were captured. And they said that they were completely surrounded by these crocodiles, that everywhere you looked, there were growling, huge crocodiles eating one person. And as soon as they were done, they would just charge after you and eat you. And at the end of their retreat, when the Japanese did get to the other side of the swamp, only 500 of the 1,000 made it out the other side. And so to this day, people stay far away from Ram Ria island because there are so many of these man-eating saltwater crocodiles that have no issue ripping you to shreds. On November 14th, 2018, John Chow hired two fishermen to take him out to this little island in the Indian Ocean. The fishermen were not excited about this, not only because it was illegal to take him out to the island, but because the last time some fishermen had gone to this island, they had both died. But the fishermen needed the money, and so they went with John, and they drove under the cover of darkness to this island, and they anchored a little ways offshore. The next morning when the sun came up, John asked the fishermen to take him in a little bit closer, but the fishermen refused. So John put a kayak in the water and he begins paddling into this island and as he gets close to the actual beach he sees someone come out of the forest who has their face painted yellow and they're screeching at the top of their lungs and john yells out that he's not threatening them he just wants to come ashore and talk to them and then a wave of people with yellow painted faces come charging out of the wood line and start firing arrows in his direction so john in a panic turns around and paddles right back out to the fishing boat later that day john tries to make another attempt at landing on this island and communicating with the people that live there so he takes his kayak and he goes down a little bit farther away from from where those people had emerged from the tree line earlier in the day and shot him with arrows. He figured he was a little bit farther out of arrow range this way. 
He lands his kayak, he gets out, and the same group of people come out farther down the beach where they had been before. They see John, they all start looking at each other and they start screeching and running down the beach towards John. John stands there until they come all the way up to him. They don't shoot him with arrows, but they take his kayak and they don't really know what to make of him. They're staring at him and they start speaking to each other in a language John doesn't understand. And then at some point, a child pulls his bow and arrow out and fires a bow directly at John and he was holding a Bible and he stopped the arrow with his Bible. And at that point, John is like, okay, I gotta go. And he jumps in the water and without a kayak has to swim a mile to get back to the fishing boat. The whole time, these people are firing arrows arbitrarily in his direction as he's swimming back out to the boat. And so the next day on November 16th, he told the fishermen he wanted them to drop him off and he would swim in and he wanted them to leave and be completely out of sight. The fishermen did not want to do this, but John reassured them that he was going to be just fine. He knew what he was doing. And so the fishermen drop him off and they leave. The next day when the fishermen come back to collect John, they see these people with painted yellow faces out on the beach dragging his body by a rope. No one knows exactly what happened to John, how they killed him. There's lots of speculation about how it went down, but it's too dangerous for anyone to go back and retrieve his body. And so his body remains at North Sentinel Island. The few hundred people that live on North Sentinel Island that were responsible for killing John Chow, they're referred to as the Sentinelese and they are unbelievably primitive. They are completely cut off from the modern world. They live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They have no conception of agriculture. They haven't even discovered fire yet. They literally have to wait for lightning to strike and then run and collect the embers and try to keep the embers alive. Researchers believe that the Sentinelese are direct descendants from the earliest human ancestors that came out of Africa. And as much as we'd like to learn more about the Sentinelese, we probably won't because they aggressively resist outside contact. They won't even let the other similarly primitive neighboring island tribes to come on their island. The Sentinelese want only Sentinelese on that island. No one else can be there. If you're not a Sentinelese and you try to go to their island, they'll just kill you. So let me know what you think of these three crazy locations and let me know if you could go to any of these three locations, which one would it be and why? The best answer to that question will get pinned at the top of the comments section. In 2009, the Jameson family, which was Bobby, who was 44, Sherilyn, who was 40, and their daughter, Madison, who was six years old, were living in Eufaula, Oklahoma, on lakefront property. While they seemed to be living a simple and happy life, behind the scenes, their life was in turmoil. Bobby suffered from bad chronic back pain that he had as a result of a car accident that he was in in 2003. Sherilyn was bipolar. She was medicated for it, but she didn't always take her meds, causing her to lash out at her family members, and it caused bouts of severe depression. Bobby and Sherilyn also believed that their house was haunted by three or four spirits who lived on their roof. Bobby was so convinced of this that he went to his pastor and asked where he could buy special bullets that he could shoot at these spirits. So for all of these reasons, the Jameson family was actually looking to leave their property in Eufaula and move somewhere else and hopefully start all over again, fresh, with a new shot at happiness. After the Jamesons would vanish, their family and friends would say, we had no idea any of this was happening. We had no idea they were even considering a move. Now, this move they were considering was not a typical move. They were not looking to move into another house. They were looking to move onto a piece of property where they could place their storage container and live in the storage container until at some point they were gonna build a house on a mountain and then move into the house. And they had actually already found a plot of land about 30 miles away from where they were currently living in a town called Red Oak. Now the storage container itself that they planned on living in was actually sitting on their property in Eufaula. And it drew a lot of attention from the neighbors because Sherilyn would graffiti on it. The neighbors have poisoned our cats. Witches don't like it when you kill their cats because it turns out Sherilyn believed that she was a witch. So unsurprisingly, the neighbors avoided the Jameson family at all cost. Several weeks before the Jameson family went missing, they actually brought in a male boarder. So a guy that was gonna live with them and help with manual labor in exchange for room and board. The boarder was a white supremacist that immediately took exception to Sherilyn, who was part Native American. And so anytime Bobby was out of the house, the white supremacist boarder would get into a fight with Sherilyn. And one day it came to a head and Sherilyn drew a gun on the boarder and said to leave the property or she was gonna shoot him. The boarder refused to leave. And so Sherilyn began 
firing shots into the ground at his feet until he left. Now, once the Jameson family disappeared, this white supremacist border became one of the primary suspects. But when the FBI found him, he had a rock solid alibi and was quickly crossed off the list of potential suspects. On October 8th, 2009, Bobby, Sherilyn, their daughter Madison, and their dog, Maisie, load up the truck and they start driving towards Red Oak. They were apparently gonna go scout out this piece of property that they wanted to purchase to, to live on with the storage container. Now, according to family and friends, it was not uncommon for the Jamesons to vanish for several days at a time without telling anybody where they went. And it would turn out that they would go into the woods for these retreats where they would get away from technology in the city. When they were gone for a few days and no one had heard from them, no one thought twice about it. On top of this, Bobby and Sherilyn had informed Madison's school that they'd be pulling her out of class because they were gonna be moving. So when Madison didn't show up for school, the school did not raise any alarms because they assumed she'd been pulled out of school. On October 16th, 2009, eight days after the Jamesons had left their house to go scout out this property in Red Oak, a couple of hunters in the Panola Mountains, which is near Red Oak, found the Jamesons truck parked on the side of the road. Now these hunters are in the middle of nowhere, which means the truck is in the middle of nowhere. And so as they're walking over to it, they're expecting to see the owner of the truck. But as they get over to the truck, there is no owner anywhere. They called out a couple times to see if they could get this person's attention or whoever it was that owned it, and no one came over to them. They look in the truck and they see there is this very sick looking dog sitting on the back seat. It would turn out it was the Jameson's dog, it was Maisie. Now the windows were up and the truck was locked. So the hunters called the police, police show up, they break a window and they get Maisie out of the truck. They give her food and water and she would end up making a full recovery, they look in the vehicle and all of the Jameson's personal effects are in there. Their phones, their wallets, their jackets, their clothes. Underneath the front seat was $32,000 of cash in a bank bag. Also, they found this weird letter written by Sherilyn to Bobby that was this 11-page hate letter that basically accused Bobby of being a hermit, which seems like a strange thing to ramble for 11 pages about, but either way. The police did an initial search of the area looking for the Jameson family, but they couldn't find them. And so the running theory was they must have pulled over and walked into the woods for some reason, got turned around, and they're just lost and we need to go find them. The police were able to use the cell phones that had been left inside of the vehicle and were able to use their GPS locations and track where the phones had been before coming to rest inside of this vehicle. And they saw that the cell phones had actually gone up the trail a little ways. They had been up towards the top of the mountain for about 15 minutes before coming back down and then wound up in the truck where they were when they were found. So the police walk up the hill to where the GPS said they had been and they find all these footprints that look to be Madison's because there's a child's footprint as well as probably Bobby's and Sherilyn's. But they're nowhere to be found and there's no clue of where they went after being up there. When they started scanning through each of the cell phones to see if there was any information about where they might have gone, they found on Bobby's phone a picture of Madison that was taken up at that little location that the GPS took them. The picture of Madison has been hotly contested on the internet for a long time now. It's hard to tell in the image if Madison is happy or sad. It's also unclear based on her body language if her parents are taking the photo or if this was kind of staged by someone else. So between the GPS showing that they had been at the top of this mountain at one point, plus the picture of Madison confirming she had at least been up there, the police started this massive search with that section on the mountain where they had been standing as kind of the center point. And they searched all around the Panola Mountains. But after an extensive search of this new area, they didn't find anything, no new leads had come in, so ultimately the search was called off. Four years later, in November of 2013, some hikers were in the Panola Mountains, about five kilometers, maybe a little bit less, from where the Jameson truck was found, and they come across skeletal remains of three individuals. It looked like two adults and a child. They were laying face down, side by side, and it was clear that they were not complete skeletons, but there was enough there to know for sure that these are people. As soon as the police were called, everybody assumed this has to be the Jameson family. It would actually take almost a year before they were able to confirm that yes, those bones are in fact the Jameson family. While the Oklahoma medical examiner was not able to determine a cause of death because the remains were just partial, they didn't have enough to work with, they did see that there was a big hole in the back of Bobby's skull and there was other holes in some of the other bones that many people assumed were from bullets, but it was never determined if that actually was what it was from. As soon as it came out that it was the Jameson family remains, the first prominent theory was that this had to have been a murder-suicide, where Sherilyn, who was mad at Bobby, she wrote that hate-filled 11-page letter that was found in the car, 
you know, she's unstable from not taking her medication to combat her bipolar disorder. She seems like the person that would take her family out and then turn on herself. But all of her family said she would never harm her daughter. I mean, maybe she would have harmed Bobby, but she never would have harmed her daughter. Also, why would you have brought your dog along and left your dog in the car and $32,000 of cash in the car. So that doesn't fit that scenario at all. The next theory was, well, maybe they just pulled over, walked into the woods for some reason, and then got lost and died of exposure. And that's still definitely a possible theory, except at the time they went missing, the temperatures were very mild. They were not dropping below freezing at night. It didn't rain very much. So it was kind of perfect conditions to be lost in the woods. It would have taken quite a while for them to die from exposure. And if you add in the fact that they were searching that area that they were found in pretty extensively within a few days of them going missing, if they had been lost and were only a few kilometers from the road, they would have been found in that search, but they weren't. The next theory that friends and family of the Jameson family predominantly believe is they were kidnapped. That maybe, you know, they were driving on that road and someone flagged them down, whether it was someone they knew or someone that did not seem threatening, that caused them to get out of their car and come over to them, leaving their car the way it was with all of their belongings inside and with their dog inside, shut the door, they're not threatened. They walk over to this person or this group and then something happens where they are either against their will or they're complicit and they walk into the woods never to go back to their truck and then they ultimately pass away in the woods just a few kilometers away. However, none of those theories can account for the very bizarre video footage that they have of the Jameson family on the day they left their house to go check out the property in Red Oak. So on October 8th, 2009, the video shows Bobby and Cheryl Lynn making multiple trips, about 20 or more, from their house to their truck, where they're loading gear into their truck. But they appear to be almost in a trance, which is what the sheriff said when he first saw the video. They're walking back and forth and they're carrying their stuff into the truck, but periodically they're making trips without carrying anything. They're just walking to the truck with nothing in hand, looking at the truck and then walking back to the house. And then they come back out and they have something in their hands and then the next trip they have nothing. And periodically on their trek back and forth, they would just stop and just turn and look off into the distance not interacting with each other. Bobby and Sherilyn haven't spoken to each other at all. They're just doing this weird trance-like commute back and forth between truck and house before ultimately they load up the truck and they do leave. A lot of people speculated that, well, it looks like Bobby and Sherilyn must have been using drugs. But when they first found the truck and they searched the Jameson's truck and they searched the Jameson family house, there was no traces of drugs anywhere and their family said there's no history of drug abuse. There was also a theory that perhaps the Jameson family got tied up in a cult and that that was why they were moving and they were going to live this minimalist lifestyle and they had brought cash to you know, give to this cult, but in fact, they had actually been the target of the cult and that was what led to their demise. Or maybe they were complicit and they wanted to sacrifice themselves or something, but no one really knows. So these are only a handful of the theories of what could have happened to the Jameson family. So what I wanna know is, do you agree with any of them? Or do you have your own theory of what could have happened to the Jameson family? Let me know in the comments. I will get back to all the early commenters. So get in there and give me your best theories. In 1991, Brian Kendall and his young family were tired of living the busy city life. He worked in Baltimore, Maryland. He was a carpenter by trade, but he and his wife, Belinda, had grown up in the country in West Virginia, and they decided to move back there, even though that would mean a multi-hour long commute for Brian to get back to Baltimore to do work because he still worked in Baltimore. So Brian and Belinda start looking for places to live in West Virginia and they find this nice home in Slainsville, West Virginia, which is a population of 182 people last time I checked. The house itself had more of a cabin feel to it. I mean, it was way out in the middle of this forest, no neighbors anywhere. It was a ranch style, so single floor, and basically everywhere you looked was just pure forest. So this cabin is super isolated, but Brian and Belinda had come from a neighborhood that wasn't very safe, and they didn't like sending their kids outside without supervision. Now, living in the middle of nowhere, they could at least let their kids go outside and not really worry about them. So even though it might have been lonely, they felt like it was at least safe. And Brian went out and got a beautiful, friendly, black lab dog to come and protect the property, and her name was Coco. They loved Coco. She was very protective of the kids right away and she blended in with the family immediately and very quickly the family really took to living in Slainsville. They loved their new home and their new life. Everything was just going so well at first. 
Shortly after they had moved into the house and finally unpacked, Belinda invited her brother as well as her brother's wife and daughter named Jordan to come over and check out the house. And so they come over, Belinda had gotten a cake and some balloons, and she planned on throwing a little mini surprise party for Jordan, who was about the same age as her kids and had recently had a birthday. And so they figured they would surprise her, give her some cake and have a little impromptu birthday party. After cake, the kids went into the living room and were playing in there together. The living room was right next to the kitchen. And so the adults were in the kitchen having coffee and chatting. And as they're chatting, they all notice something very strange going on in the living room with the kids. The kids had taken all of the balloons and brought them into the living room. And they had all floated up to the ceiling. And there was pretty high ceilings inside of this living room. And as the adults are looking in the direction of the kids and these balloons, they notice one of the balloons comes down from the ceiling, but the string is tight, as if someone's holding the balloon and pulling it down, but no one was pulling on the balloon. The adults stopped talking and they've all noticed this and they're all looking at it because it looked very unnatural. The balloon stops right in the middle of the room and it's a ways away from the kids and the kids haven't noticed it. And the parents are just quietly watching this balloon and no one knows what to make of it. No one's even commenting that this is happening. They're all just quiet and watching. And the balloon starts moving across the room over to where Jordan was. Jordan notices the balloon for the first time. She turns and goes, thank you, as if she's talking to someone, but no one's there. She reaches out to take the balloon and as she goes to grab it, it drifts right back up to the ceiling as if someone had been holding it and let go of it. And Jordan like kind of grabbed for it, watched it go to the ceiling, and then Jordan just turned around and kept on playing. That startled everybody. They could make sense of a balloon coming down and then moving. The helium could be leaking, there could be a draft in the room, but for it to go right back up and look like someone had released it, they couldn't explain that. And so the parents go right in the living room. They're looking at each other. The parents are, and they're like, did you see that? What was that about? And they grab that balloon down from the ceiling and they're trying to like replicate what they saw. And they're kind of looking at each other like, are we going crazy? And they go over to Jordan and they say, hey, who are you talking to a minute ago? And she couldn't really articulate anything. And they said, when the balloon was right here in front of you, who are you talking to? And she stops and kind of thinks about it for a second. She's a young kid, you know, she's, she's like two or three years old. She thinks about it and she points in the direction where no one's standing and goes, him. The parents look in the direction of where she's pointing. They look at each other and then they start laughing because they're like, okay, we're scaring ourselves. Obviously, you know, the helium must have come out and maybe there's a draft and, and she's three. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's probably got an imaginary friend. Like, we're just scaring each other. Let's just drop it. Let's forget the balloon. And so they do. They forget the balloon and they don't think about it again. But after Jordan and her parents leave, Belinda and Brian would say to each other, like, that was pretty weird. A couple of days later, Brian asked his daughter, Blair, who was about five or six years old, if she wanted to come with him and go explore the back forest behind their property because Brian had been working so much, he hadn't really had a chance to go explore and he figured now's a good chance to go. Blair's super excited. The two of them go out into the backyard and they start walking around. And after walking a bit of a ways, they stop because they see something in the middle of the forest that shouldn't have been there. They see this van, like a vehicle, that looked like it had been set on fire at one point. It's totally charred. It's basically just the frame and it's parked in the middle of the forest and there are no roads anywhere. And they go in the back of the vehicle and look inside and there are all these burnt stuffed animals and kids toys that are in the back of this van. And there is what looks to be the spring of a mattress that must have been caught up in this fire that burned the vehicle. And Brian just had this sinking feeling that something was wrong with this scene. And he said, hey, you know what, Blair, we gotta go. Let's not look at this. We don't know what this is. Let's just go. When they get back to the house, Brian would tell Belinda what he found. How would that van have gotten there? And why was it there. It just didn't make any sense to either of them. Over the first couple of months that they were living in Slainsville, Brian was trying to commute daily to his work in Maryland, but it was taking up hours and hours of his day. He was getting no sleep and it just didn't make sense. And so even though they only had one car, he started commuting on Monday morning to work and then staying with his mom who lived in Maryland and then coming back to Slainsville on Friday night, which would mean that every week, Monday to Friday, Belinda and the kids would be alone in their cabin in the woods in Slainsville with no vehicle. But Belinda had grown up in a very isolated house in the middle of a forest in West Virginia. So she wasn't a stranger to this type of setup and so really didn't have any issues with this lifestyle that they had in Slainsville. 
Blair had been asking ever since they moved in if she could go camping one night out in their RV. They had a little RV camper that was parked right outside their property and she wanted to spend a night out there by herself. And so one week when Brian was away for work, Belinda finally caved and said, okay, Blair, you can stay in the camper tonight. She wasn't thrilled about this idea, but she felt like the kids had a little bit of cabin fever going on because they were so cooped up in this house. And she figured this is an easy way to make Blair feel a little bit happier living here. So she told Blair, once you go in there, I want you to lock the door and not open it again. And Coco, their dog, is going to stay with you. Blair was just fine with this setup. And so that night she went out to the camper. She had Coco with her. She had all her warm clothes on. She brought a, a lantern with her and some books she was going to read. She goes out and her mom tucks her into her bed inside of the RV and gives her a kiss. And then she leaves. In the camper, there was a pull-out bed that she was on that took up the majority of the floor space in the camper. On her right, as she was laying down, was a big window with a blackout curtain that slid across the whole thing and she kept that curtain shut. At the foot of her bed to the right was the door that led into the camper and there was a window on that as well, but there was no blind to block it. And so at some point Blair is tired, she turns off her lantern and she gets under her covers with Coco right next to her and she goes to sleep. At some point in the night, Blair wakes up suddenly because Coco is acting really strange. She's very uneasy and she's looking towards the door that leads into the camper and she's acting like she just saw something. So Blair sits up, she's trying to calm down Coco and she looks at the window on the door and she can look outside, there's a little bit of moonlight outside so she's got a little bit of illumination and as she's looking, she sees what looks like a figure walk past the door. She can't tell if it's a person or if it's an animal or what it is but she definitely saw something walk past the door and Coco clearly saw it too because Coco begins growling and instead of just looking at the door where this figure was, Coco basically follows the figure and is now looking at the window right next to Blair. Blair thinks it's her mom and so she tries to calm down Coco. She turns on her lantern and she goes to the front door and she peeks her head out. She doesn't see anything. She unlocks it and opens it and pokes her head out. She doesn't see her and she goes, mom? And there's no one out there. She looks up at the house, which is right next to her, and all the lights are off. There's no sign that her mom left the house. Suddenly feeling really startled, she shuts the door, locks it, and goes back in her bed. Now the whole time that Blair had turned that lantern on and gone down to the door and yelled for her mom, Coco was still on the bed looking at the window where the blackout curtains were covering up whatever was on the other side. Now when Blair's going back to the bed, Coco is showing her teeth. She's baring her teeth and she's growling at the window. Blair's totally spooked. She jumps into her bed, throws the covers over her head, and she's sitting there hoping that Coco will just stop and that this will all end and she can go to sleep, but Coco doesn't stop. And she's like reaching out and trying to pull Coco to get under the covers with her but Coco won't stop. Blair decides she has to take a look out that window and she thinks maybe it is my mom. Maybe I just missed her before and she's trying to come in. Maybe she was knocking and I didn't hear her. And so she takes her covers off her head, gets right up next to the side of the wall. She's underneath the window, which is right next to her. And she starts pulling aside that curtain. And as soon as she's got a view out the window, she sees a dark figure that looks like a man or something standing right outside the glass, looking down into her camper. She's so scared. She drops the curtain and just gets under her covers. Coco goes right on top of Blair and is standing standing over Blair, basically protecting her. And at some point, Blair does manage to fall asleep. Meanwhile, on the same night, there was some other drama happening up at the main house. Belinda had put Blair's younger brother, Sean, to bed almost immediately after she tucked in Blair inside of the camper. Sean was three years old and he was a great sleeper. She could put him in his bed, say goodnight to him, and she wouldn't see him until the next morning. But that night, Belinda was laying in bed and Sean multiple times would get out of his bed and come into her bedroom and say he was scared and didn't want to be in his room. Belinda would get up, she'd go back, she'd tuck him back in and say, you got nothing to worry about, it's just a new house, you're fine, you're safe. But on the third or fourth time that this happened, because it was so out of character, she asked Sean, what's going on? What are you so scared of? And he says, there's a monster in my window. Belinda assumes what he means is maybe a deer was outside or some other animal might have walked by the window. Because in virtue of being a single story house, all of the bedroom windows are at ground level. And so she goes to the window and she looks out and it's just forest, deep, dark forest everywhere you look. And so she's thinking, okay, maybe a deer walked by the window or, or a moose or something like that. And that's what he saw. And so she was able to explain to him that, you know, it's just a new house. There's probably some deer that are coming by the window. You got nothing to worry about. And so she was able to finally calm him down and he would go to sleep. 
The next morning, Blair is relieved to wake up and have sunlight be coming through that little open window on the front door. She and Coco go into the main house. She sits down for breakfast with her mom and with her brother. And Belinda asks her, how was camping? And Blair, who was normally a very chatty child, was very quiet about it. And her mom said, well, did you have a good time? Like, you can tell me anything about it? And Blair just said, you know, I don't think I want to go camping again. And she didn't elaborate. She just didn't want to talk about it. And so Belinda didn't ask any more questions. And that was that. That day goes by without incident. And then that night, Belinda gets Sean and Blair to bed in their normal rooms. They're asleep. Belinda goes to her bed and she falls asleep. And she starts to have this very strange dream. In her dream, she wakes up and looks at the foot of her bed and she sees a boy, a boy she doesn't recognize. And he's signaling her to come with him. And so in her dream, she gets up out of her bed and she follows him out of her room and she goes out to the front yard and it's daylight outside. And on her front yard are all these clotheslines strung all over the front yard. And there are these white sheets that are hanging from each of these clotheslines, all in different random directions. And she's trying to find this boy and she can't find him because all the sheets keep getting in her way. She finally stops because she feels something on her toe. And she looks down, she's barefoot, and on her right big toe is a clothespin that had been pinched onto her toe. And so she reaches down and pulls it off and that's when she wakes up. And now she's awake in real life. And so she sits up and she's kind of looking around and she's in that immediate fog following a really vivid dream. And then she realizes that was just a dream, gets back in bed and she goes to sleep. The next day she gets up, she gets out of her bed and she begins pulling her blankets up to make her bed. As she's walking around the foot of the bed, she stops because she sees something on the ground, a clothespin. They don't own any clothespins. And so she's sitting there looking at it, thinking how could that have gotten there? What was that dream about? Was I awake? Was I doing something in my sleep? Was I sleepwalking? She can't make sense of it, but it totally freaked her out. That day, Belinda told her sister about this dream with the clothespin and then finding it at the foot of the bed. And her sister's like, look, you probably just need a break. You're, you're alone with the kids all the time. You're isolated. Let me come over. I'll watch the kids and you can just go for a walk and, and do whatever. Just clear, clear your mind. And so Belinda's sister comes over, takes the kids and Belinda decides that what she's going to do is go explore the woods behind their house. She walks a little ways behind their property and she sees something that really stands out to her. It was a little cemetery and it was on their property or at least least close to their property. She goes over to it and sees there are four small headstones. There's no writing on them, but the size of the headstone themselves, it seemed to indicate that these could have been children. And so she was very unsettled by it and decided that, you know what, I'm done with my walk and I'm just going to go back now. A couple of days later, Blair was sleeping in her room when she woke up suddenly for no apparent reason. She sat up, she kind of looked around, and she noticed that the curtains that normally would cover up her window that overlooked her bed were open. And she felt really uneasy by this, especially after that incident in the RV. She liked having those curtains closed. So she gets up to go over and shut this curtain and she looks out the window and she sees standing in front of the tree line is a dark silhouette of a figure. It looks like a man or some person. And she freezes and she's looking at it and she can tell that it's moving towards her. And she's looking even closer and then she can tell it's now running at her. She shuts it, jumps into her bed and covers herself up. As she's laying there under her covers, not knowing what to do, she hears Coco barking from her mom's room. Belinda wakes up to Coco barking and looks at what she's looking at and it's the window. So Belinda gets up, she looks out the window, she doesn't see anything and tells Coco to calm down. She figured, okay, maybe she saw a deer or something. And then just to be a good mom, she checks on her kids. She goes to Sean's room. Sean didn't wake up from the barking. He's asleep in his bed. But when Belinda goes into Blair's room, Blair is hiding under her covers and she's scared of something. And she asks Blair, honey, what's wrong? And Blair finally says that she saw something. She thought it was a person. She didn't know what, but it was running towards the house. And so Belinda's thinking to herself, she just saw an animal because that's probably what Sean saw when he thought he saw a monster outside. And I'm sure that's what Coco saw. You know, Coco's gonna react to an animal. There's probably some deer that's coming right up to the window and it's scaring my kids, it's scaring my dog. And so Belinda tells Blair, you got nothing to worry about, honey. Go back to sleep, everything's gonna be fine. She calms her down, she puts her to sleep. She double checks on Sean, Sean's still sleeping. And Belinda and Coco go back into Belinda's room and they get in bed and Belinda goes back to sleep. At some point in the night, Belinda's laying with her back to the door and she feels someone tapping on the back of her head. And she's assuming at this point, it's gotta be Sean or even Blair who've come in there cause they're scared again. And reflexively without even opening her eyes, she says, honey, there's nothing outside. You get nothing to be scared of, go back to sleep. There's a silence and then she feels tapping on her head again. 
Now she opens her eyes and she rolls over to tell one of her two kids that everything's fine, but there's no one there. It startles her because not only is there no one there, but Coco is now on the bed growling in the direction of wherever this tapping was coming from. Immediately, Belinda flips on the light and she's looking around her room and there's nothing. Gets up and she goes into her kids' rooms. They are fast asleep. Just to be sure, she walks around the house, makes sure everything is locked. She gets back in her bed and she's sitting there with Coco and she can't help it, she's scared. Between her kids seeing stuff outside, finding that cemetery, the, the weird clothespin thing going on, now something feeling like it was tapping her but no one's in the room with her, she's scared. And in fact, she would say in interviews that this was the first time that she even thought about the word haunted in relationship to what was going on at their house. The next day, Belinda just wanted to get away from the house. So she calls her mom and says, hey, can we use your car for the day to go run some errands? Her mom says, absolutely. Her mom drops the car off and Belinda and the kids load up and they head into town. When they left, they put Coco in her outdoor cage, totally locked and secure. So they head out and they go to this gas station in Slainsville and Belinda gets out, she's fueling up her car and another resident of Slainsville pulls up right next to her and she's filling up her car. And the two women strike up a conversation. At some point in this discussion, the woman asks Belinda where she lives in Slainsville because she's a longtime resident and she didn't recognize Belinda. Belinda describes where she lives and the woman who's familiar with the area says, well, do you know the story of your property? And Belinda's like, no. She's like, well, years and years ago, there was a really bad fire. I think it was right near your property that a whole family died in. And Belinda says, you know what? I, I actually found a small cemetery a little ways back on our property, but that's what it is. As Belinda is driving away and she's thinking about the story she's been told, she has this sense of relief that now she has some closure on why there's that cemetery on her property. And she couldn't help but think if her house is haunted, which she had only recently considered, Maybe it's not such a bad thing to have it be this family that's doing the haunting. It didn't feel evil, it just felt kind of sad, and she was empathetic for this lost family. When they got back from running those errands, Coco was gone. They went to the fence and it hadn't been opened. There was no sign that she'd been able to burrow underneath this fence. There was no way for her to get out unless you opened the gate and it was locked and shut. And so they didn't know what to make of that. And the only thing they could come up with is someone must have taken Coco. And unfortunately, they would never see Coco again. It was a huge loss for this family. Coco was not only a dog they loved and considered part of their family, but she was also their protection and it was it was a very big deal that she was gone. A couple of days go by and Brian's home from work and everyone in the house is asleep except for Belinda. Belinda was up watching TV. And at some point she turns off the TV and she also goes to bed. She starts having the same dream she had when she felt that clothespin on her toe. In her dream, she wakes up and at the foot of her bed is this boy, the same boy that she had followed outside that she could never find in the sheets. And so she gets up and, and she starts following this boy. He brings her out to the front of the house, out onto the front yard. And again, the whole front yard is covered in these white sheets that are strung up along clotheslines. And as she's making her way across the front yard, pulling sheets aside, she finally reaches a clearing and she sees this boy who looks like about the same age as her son, Sean. And this boy looks terrified and she's looking at him and the boy is kind of looking to his left. And then from behind one of the sheets next to the boy, walks this dark figure that stands right next to him and looks up at her. And it's an expressionless dark figure. It almost looks like a man. And it starts walking up the lane of sheets towards her. She falls over backwards and she wakes up 
And when she wakes up in real life, she hears screaming coming from her own son's room. She and Brian jump up out of bed and run into Sean's room. He's laying on the ground with his arm cocked to the side. It's clearly been broken. And he's screaming and guarding his arm. And Belinda's over him saying, what happened? What happened? And the boy just says, the monster came in the window. They don't know what to make of this. They're not sure if that means an intruder came in or what, but they have to get him to the hospital. They scoop him up, they grab Blair and they get in the car and they leave. They get Sean to the hospital and sure enough, he's got a very bad break in his arm and he needs to stay at the hospital for a couple of days. Now this happened on a Sunday night and so Brian had to go back to Maryland the next day for work. So their car was gone. So three days later, when it was time to get Sean, Belinda had to borrow her mother's car to go pick him up. So Belinda gets her mother's car and she and Blair drive to the hospital. They pick up Sean. As they're driving back, the car breaks down and they're on the side of the road with flashers on and Belinda doesn't know what to do. Luckily, a good Samaritan is driving by. Another resident of Slainsville sees them pulled over. She pulls over, it's an older woman, and she says, hey, can I give you guys a ride? Belinda's like, thank you, yes, we need a ride. So she, Sean, and Blair load up in the car and they start driving to their house. And so Belinda tells this woman where she lives, yep, you take this road, you get up to our house, it's set back in the woods there. And when she realizes where Belinda lives, she looks at Belinda and goes, you do know the history of your house, right? And Belinda looks at her and goes, yeah, the, the fire that, that, that killed the family, we're aware. She goes, no, not a fire. The last occupant of your house was rumored to be hurting children on your property. And there's no proof, but some of the local men here decided they were gonna take justice into their own hands, and they convinced this guy to go hunting with them. And they brought him out in the woods behind his house, and they ambushed him, and his body's never been found. It's rumored there's a van somewhere in the woods near your house where they put him inside of it, shut the doors, and lit it on fire. Belinda's in shock hearing this, because now, if her house is haunted, which she's believing it is, it's not some nice family that was sadly lost in a fire. It's this horrible man. They finally got back to the house. They said bye to the woman and Belinda and her kids went inside. And for Belinda, it was like this horrible sense of dread being in the house. It just felt evil. And she realized that she couldn't stay there anymore. So she picks up the phone, she calls Brian and she says, I cannot stay here another night. I have to go. And so Brian says, okay. He drives back from Maryland. They pack some bags, they get in his car and they all leave for Brian's mom's house. And that was it. They never stayed another night at that house. They only went back a couple times to pack up their stuff, put it in moving trucks and they left. So I'd love to get your feedback on this story. Do you think that the house was indeed haunted or do you think there's some other explanation? Let me know in the comments and I will respond to all the early commenters. So get in there and give me your theories. If you enjoyed today's story and you haven't done this already, please take all of the like buttons, white articles of clothing and wash them with a bright red brand new t-shirt. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. If you have a story submission that you think could work on this channel, whether it's your personal story or just a suggestion, please go to our subreddit. It's just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. I read it every single day. And if I intentionally use your submission, I will absolutely credit you. 